Hello, everyone. I'm Danica Scott with the National Association of Cannabis Businesses, and welcome to week three, um, the 920 discussion on social equity. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to do a quick attendance today of who all is on the line. Um, Ashley Reynolds. Present. Nader Hashim. Present. Susanna Davis. Present. And Julio, and I'm sorry, I don't see your last name, but we'll get it captured. Julio Thompson. Thank you. Jeffrey Gallegos. Present. Gina Cranwinkle. Present. And from the CCB, if you'll let me know who's there. Sure, you have Julie Holbert, board member, uh, Nellie Marvel. David Julie and Nellie. Yep, David Scher and Bryn Hare. And we have five members of the public. I believe that is just, could everybody hear me okay? That is Julie and Nellie and they're okay, fantastic. All right. So before we get started, I would like to also see if we can get for the minutes from two seconds, from the 13th if I of, of, of September if I could get a motion to approve the minutes from September 13th. And if, if I can get a first or a second and then a second, please. Or do we need to modify? Nada or Ashley? Um, they don't need to be modified, all set. Okay. No, I don't think they need to be modified either. Okay, can I get a first and a second, please? Just state it for the record. I'll make that motion. Thank you. Second. Thank you. Fantastic. So just as a quick reminder, we always put this slide up so that everyone can see the milestones we have coming up. And it is September 20th. So we definitely have um, some things coming up rapidly on us, the plan for reducing or eliminating fees for social equity applicants, and then the development of the criteria for applicants for the purpose of obtaining social equity loans and grants from the Cannabis, Devel Cannabis Business Development Fund. What is important to note here is that um, we're working simultaneously on these issues. So. Uh, yes, we need to approve both. Okay, great. Because we made um, a modification. On 916. Yeah, revised. Yeah. Ashley or Nodder, would uh, either of you be willing to um, approve those or get that started? Or have you had the opportunity to review them, the 916 minutes? Um, I, they look good to me. I motion. I'll second the motion as well. Thank you so much. Let the record reflect that the minutes from 916 have also been approved. Gina, I'm gonna turn it over to you as we, oh, no, I'll keep it. We don't have any electronic comments. So that, so that is what is confusing me. I apologize on that one. Um, there are no new written comments, but as a reminder, anyone may, that is in Vermont may submit their public comments via the CCB website. We look forward to receiving those and rest assured that everyone on the subcommittee does see the uh, comments. And at the end of this meeting at 10 till the hour, we have, if we have members of the public who would like to speak and be heard, that will um, be made available. So thank you. And now we're ready to move forward unless I have forgotten anything else today. All right, very good. Okay, um, Gina, yeah. take it away. Great. So last meeting we left off with defining a social equity candidate. I know we had Ashley and Nader on last call, but Ashley um, dropped off at the half of the hour and so we were not able to um, vote on if this is the way that we are going to define a social equity candidate. So right now we have um, one that they live in an opportunity zone um, to their member of BIPOC uh, a minority race. Uh, three, 
if they were impacted on cannabis prohibition, so if they had been arrested, convicted, or incarcerated um, for a nonviolent cannabis offense, um, or if they are a member of an impacted family. We also had a one-year um, residential requirement um, to join the social equity program. Now, um, after some of our discussions, I wanted to revisit residency before um, we spoke about this, and I also wanted just a brief a conversation about family as well. Um, so just a family member is a relationship to the impacted individual, it's a parent, a legal guardian, a sibling, spouse, child, min a minor in the guardianship of uh, these people or a grandparent or a grandchild. How does everybody feel with that, those requirements of a family member that has been impacted on someone being incarcerated due um, to cannabis? Um, Nader, I see. Yeah, I, I support that. I think I think that's something we need to include, and um, I think it looks good. Right. Thank you, Ashley. I agree. I, I think that's a better definition of impacted family. Leo. Um, well, I'm new. I'm new to all of this, so I'm, I'm working a little bit behind. But it, you're talking about. Uh, not just uh, immediate parents and family, but grandparents, is that right? Yes, that's correct. And any children, um, because we do realize that there are multi-generational um, people in a family household, so that those people can also be impacted and or um, someone who is in guardianship of a minor who may not be necessarily um, their mother or father. But these are not in-laws? Or a sibling, spouse. Uh, no, this is not in-law. Okay. Uh, unless they were the guardian of, of the minor. Yeah, I understand that. I, are you all looking at a, a, maybe I'm just looking at the slide on the screen. Is there another document that has the definition that I don't have that I could pull up off of? Maybe the invitation. Um, this is the definition that we're going to go by based on family. Of the side that you see, that's a relationship to the impacted individual, which would be the parent, the legal guardian, sibling, spouse, child, minor, and the guardianship, a grandparent, a grandchild. Danika, is that impacted family slide on this deck? I'm not sure um, just yet. I think I, it's slide nine of 28. I was able to navigate forward. There you go. Uh, yeah, um, that's the slide I just had up. Sorry. Okay. I, I, is everybody seeing slide nine? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I do know. My, I think my slide was not in, uh, not in sync, but it is now. So thank you. Sorry for that. I, I, yeah, I don't have any concerns about that. Okay, great. And Susanna? Yep, comfortable with this, thanks. And I'm just for everyone to be aware, Susanna will be leaving at the uh, half of the hour. You ready? Now I just want to go back to residency. So just to give you some perspective of residencies that they have um, required in other states, it's normally for an opportunity zone. So in Colorado, they have at least 15 years and they chose this specific time frame, which was between 1980 and 2010, where they felt that there was at the most harm that was done in Colorado. Um, and that was before their legalization. And then in Illinois, um, for disproportionately impacted, areas is five out of the last 10 years. Um, in Massachusetts, they also have for disproportionately impacted areas five out of the past 10 years. For drug convictions, it is the last um, 12 months. And um, in Michigan, they require um, at least, they give a reduced licensing fee if you have lived there as the five out of the last 10 years. I'm just gonna hand this over to Jeffrey because as cannabis is new to the United States, there are changes all the time that are occurring. And there have been some recent lawsuits 
um, dealing with interstate commerce issues. Um, Jeffrey, can you please give us some information about that? Sure, so I'll try to keep it, um, because it's kind of confusing a little bit, the whole concept of the Dormant Commerce Clause applying to the cannabis industry. Um, So the Dormant Commerce Clause says it, that a state cannot, so where where the Congress has not made an official ruling on on regulating interstate commerce, um, the states can, they have some flexibility to to regulate it, but they can't do, a state can't regulate, they can't, they, a state can't regulate an industry in a way that would impact interstate commerce. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. Um, so, so what's happening now is that the states that are bringing forth these residency requirements, some people that are that are from out of state that want to participate in the industry are suing, saying that you're discriminating against me because I live out of state and um, I want to participate in this market and they bring it under the Dormant Commerce Clause. So what's confusing as far as cannabis goes is, um, is Congress has, has expressly prohibited interstate commerce of cannabis. And so I'm not quite sure how that would trigger the Dormant Commerce Clause, but these lawsuits are happening and there's one that just happened in the city of Detroit called Lowe, Lowe versus city of Detroit, L-O-W-E. And that judge, I believe they ruled in favor of the plaintiff who, uh, who is bringing that against the interstate commerce clause. Um, so it's just a heads up that these residency requirements can can possibly raise an issue if, if, uh, if an out-of-state person who wants to participate in the Vermont market um, can, can, uh, can bring forth an action and sometimes they're winning. So just a heads up that that could happen. Does this all make sense? I feel like I'm doing word salad on the call. Does this all make sense? Yes, no. Thank you, Jeffrey. I'm just gonna summarize that for everybody. Um, right now, interstate commerce is not allowed for cannabis. Obviously, we cannot cross any cannabis into a different state. However, some people are feeling that if they move to Vermont, that they should have the same opportunities of being a social equity candidate. And that is the question that we have around. Um, There are cases that are coming up, but we're not really sure what the full determination will be on that, but I wanted everyone to be aware on this conversation. Obviously, when um, the federal legalization happens with cannabis, this will be more of a concern um, for Vermont, which um, can revise their standards at that time. So just wanted to see how people feel about this residency requirement. You know, do we do you want to just limit this to opportunity zones and not have them, you know, based on two or three? Do we want to have one year? Do we want to have more than one year? Do we want to have no year? Um, who would like to discuss residency first? Nader. So how? So if we're concerned interstate commerce of cannabis, uh, if somebody is living here for a year, how, do, how does that create liability for the state of Vermont? It, I mean, it, it, is the concern that they're going to just get an apartment here for a year and then bounce back to Massachusetts or another state? Is that what the concern is? Um, the concern with interstate commerce is if someone came, say, from Massachusetts and was now residing in Vermont, they're going to want the opportunity if they fit one of these qualifications for a social equity candidate. Right now, we would be limiting them and saying that you need to have at least lived in Vermont for one year before you would be able to qualify as a social equity candidate. And so having that time restriction of a year or more does that shield Vermont from liability or it, are, are, are we concerned that, I'm just trying to make the connection in my brain between the interstate commerce risk and the residency requirements. So, the, so Jeffrey? The, um, the concern is the potential for somebody living out of state currently that would move to Vermont and claim that the state is discriminating against them because they're not a state resident. That's the concern. Okay. 
Yeah. Um, with that being said, we do not know, we don't have enough cases to say what the full determination will be on that. Um, we can only really give you information of what we've seen, but we want you to be fully informed before you make uh, a recommendation. Uh, with that being said, how do how do you feel, Nader, about the one-year residential requirement? I mean, at this moment, I'm still fine with keeping it at one year. Okay. Thank you, Nader. Uh, Ashley, how do you feel about the one-year requirement? Um, oh, well, looking at these other states, you know, I think these are all really good requirements. I don't see why Vermont honestly can't incorporate all of these. I think these are well thought out. I think that it protects the residents um, in the state that they're residing. Um, I feel like I'm getting a little bit bogged down by interstate commerce, you know, as well. Um, neither, so I, I don't want you to feel like, you know, you're thinking short-sighted. I find myself thinking short-sighted because I feel like federal legalization is going to take forever. <laughs> um, so I'd rather do as much as we can to protect on a state level um, as long as we can. But in the meantime, um, yeah, I like all of these requirements of increasing the residency requirement um, from one year. I want to make sure that Vermonters who have really been impacted in Vermont are the ones that are benefiting the most. Um, you know, I can see that case and understand the parameters around that case that's happening that you mentioned, Jeffrey. But um, like you said, you know, we don't know how it's going to play out. Um, you know, you said perhaps it's going in the plaintiff's favor. Um, I think that's going to be tricky given the climate here in Vermont. Um, I certainly, you know, know a lot of folks who are, you know, have had convictions here in Vermont and went out west and are thriving in a legal cannabis market both in Colorado and in California. Um, they all did live there and establish the residency. Um, in the states, like in Colorado specifically. Um, no, they're not going after um, um, social equity um, licenses. You know, that's, that's not what these people are going after, but they have established the residency in the states that they are working in currently in the legal market. So I don't think that increasing it to, you know, two, three, you know, I'd like to see five, um, I don't think that that's going to hinder that many people, to be honest. Um, and I think that in the spirit of Vermonters, it protects us and allows us to have a little bit more of an equal um, playing field, to be honest. Um, thanks. Thank you, Ashley. And would you like um, two, three, or five years for all of the three categories that we indicated here? Opportunity zones, minorities, and uh, prohibition, and so arrested. Yeah, yeah. I, I think okay. all of these that are currently operating in other, these are other Dillon states as well, um, I think it, it's really important. There's a reason that they set these numbers, and I think for us to try to go and reinvent the wheel it, is a little silly. Um, thank you so much for that. Julio, how do you feel about this? Um, so I, I took a look at the low decision um, that Jeffrey mentioned, um, which also cites a decision from last summer for Portland, Maine, um, Energy versus City of Portland, where an out-of-state resident challenged Portland's ordinance. And they also won a preliminary injunction. That doesn't mean they won the whole lawsuit, but they were able to freeze at the outset of the lawsuit that out-of-state requirement on the same grounds, which is that it on its face discriminates against uh, people from out-of-state without satisfying what in constitutional law is called strict scrutiny, which is a heightened level to show that the state has a strong interest that can't be addressed by, or you know, reasonably addressed by other means than that. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know if anyone has had if any city or state has had a challenge where they defeated the challenge um, 
I'm only aware of two, and the the government lost both times. Um, so I, I'm I'm a, I'm a little uncertain because I'd like to see if there's an example of a court going the other way. I mean, uh, you know, it's we, we know that Vermont can't restrict the sale of maple syrup in the state to only Vermont maple syrup. Um, and, um, and so the question uh, to people who are in the state of Vermont. And so I think it's important if Vermont is looking towards a residency requirement, I think I would be more comfortable hearing the reasons for Vermont's needs that are specific to Vermont rather than relying upon another state. What Illinois did in Illinois um, doesn't really apply to what the, the experience of folks have been in Vermont. So I think it is worth exploring what the history has been in Vermont specific because specifically because I think if there is a legal challenge we're going to have to demonstrate that track record and what Illinois did is not going to be relevant to Vermont's exercise of Vermont government power. So um, I'm a little at sea here because again I don't know what the state of the legal playing field is. I, I know it's an issue and it's enough of an issue that two different uh, and I don't know if the low case was a federal case. I assume it was. Um, the, um, the, 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 the Portland, Maine case was a federal case. And I'm not sure where, that, what, where they are right now, whether there's, it's unlikely that there was a, you know, a decision on an appeal so quickly. So um, it seems to me that some, I mean, because there are different, and I don't want to take up too much airtime on this, but I can imagine somebody who was, as a, as a young adult, being impacted by Vermont's enforcement of medical or, or of its marijuana laws and then leaving Vermont, maybe because of that, uh, and then returning to Vermont and wanting to participate in the market. Um, and that person would have something of a case to make about the impact of their lives, but the residency requirement for, for a period of time, you know, would be, you know, it was, sounds like it would it would trip them up so I'm I don't think our, my views are um, you know my own views and I'm sitting in for the AG and I haven't spoken with him about this requirement but my own views are a little uh, unformed yet thank you Julio those were great points um, how I do see the requirement is that they had to have lived in the state for at least one year. If they left and they came back, I think they would fulfill that one year requirement. Um, but very good points that were made. Jeffrey, did you want to add about the other court cases? These are just kind of starting to pop up. Um, then the low case, I believe that's Eastern District of Michigan federal case. Um, so there's, there's not really a case law record yet kind of developing now. Um, rather than bringing an equal protection charge, they'll bring a dormant commerce clause. And uh, yeah, I think that once it hits the appellate courts, maybe somebody will recognize that, that the dormant commerce clause probably wouldn't even be triggered as of now, but in planning ahead for, for a future with interstate commerce, just a heads up. But yeah, to answer your question, there's there's nothing solid yet because it's all just coming down this year. It's all just happening now. Susanna, how do you feel? I appreciate Julio's point a lot. Um, I, I also agree that it's, yes, um, one big thing is about, sorry, I'm, I sound like I'm talking really fast because I have to jump off. <laughs> Let me just slow down for a second. Um, so I appreciate those points because yes, it's about who's here and who has withstood all of the challenges of living here, but also about who has been pushed away and why, right? And being able to do right by those folks too. So I appreciate that point. Um, and about the fact that, you know, Vermont is unique. And so we've got to come up with something that, that uniquely fits us. I also would agree with Ashley in that I wouldn't even mind necessarily raising it past a year, a little bit, but I don't want to, I wouldn't want to see, like, I think five years would probably be excessive because there's a presumption of stability 
right? And especially when we're talking about historically marginalized groups, I think that it, it, it may be inappropriate of us to presume a level of housing stability that would lead a person to have lived somewhere for 15 years or for five years, whether it's consecutive or broken up. So I would ask us to reconsider that the population we're really looking to lift up may not may not have the level of stability that we're assuming uh, in order to qualify. So I would just, I would leave it at that. I'm sorry to drop that and run away, but I do have to, to run, but I'll look out for the minutes afterwards. I appreciate your, your time with everyone. Thank you, and that was a great comment, Susanna. Thanks. So, and Nader, after our conversation just now, how do you feel about the time requirement? So, um, Susanna uh, articulated what was on my mind much better than I could um, regarding the presumption of housing stability, um, and that's why I predominantly lean towards the lower and when it comes to the years that we'd require for residency. Uh, I mean, I support one year, but I'm happy to agree to two years if that's uh, what, we, what we're looking at compromising at. Okay, and uh, Julio, um, how do you feel about the residency requirement? I think I'm I'm not sure about it. Um, like I said, I feel like I, I, I need a little bit more background. Um, in, in the Portland, Maine case, the court issued the injunction against the residency requirement, even though earlier in the case, the state of Maine said that they were not going to enforce the residency requirement according to the court because the attorney general for the state of Maine said that it had significant constitutional issues and likely would not be enforceable. So, um, so it does, it, I mean, just looking at that court's decision, it, it wasn't just the opinion of the sole federal judge, but if the court is correct, I mean, I haven't looked at the underlying papers, but it sounds like the AG of the state of Maine agreed and told uh, or, or stated that for the entire state of Maine, they were not going to enforce that requirement. Um, so I'm, 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 I'm hesitant again, because I haven't seen anyone yet make the challenge and say that challenge is legally meritless. Um, and so, um, that, that's kind of where I am now. I mean, I, it's one thing to make it a requirement. It's another one if you are having, uh, you know, if, the, if there's competitive, if there's competition for the position uh, as to whether that might offer you some points on the board, so to speak, but is not a uh, a minimum requirement that necessarily excludes 49 states and D.C. and Puerto Rico um, off the bat, but that they can compete and maybe there are other points they can put on the board and still remain competitive. Uh, I, I'm, I'm interested in, in thinking about that as opposed to just drawing a line. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, uh, you know, I, I come at it again, I'm, I'm a lawyer in the AG's office, so I, I come at it from the standpoint that I would want to have something that's not that's not going to um, hold up the you know the process here on, on a legal challenge so uh, I, I can't I can't say firmly one way or the other I'm just I'm just kind of undecided at this point because I feel like I need to know more okay thank you I Julio it's a good point and um, I see the Nakers hand raised one of the points that I do want to make is that I think that we need to take more time. I'll be contacting everyone um, independently to kind of give more information and more research for this. Danica? Thank you. So the only question that I would like to pose for clarity um, is to understand when we are talking a residency requirement, how we define that residency requirement, meaning is it the state or is it that you have to live in that same DIA area 
or many DIA areas within the required time period. And I only say that because people who do not own homes and that are considered middle Americans and, and lower income do move once a year, typically because they are renting. Um, I could get the statistical pieces on that if we needed to prove it, as it's coming from my, my banking days. So I think it's important that we note that, that there's a state residency requirement and then there is a DIA residency requirement. And I know that may sound confusing, but if someone is a social equity candidate, and they've moved five of the last five years, but only lived in a DIA twice, but perhaps maybe fall into some of the same areas. I'm just putting that out there as something I think we need to clarify. Can I follow? Very good point, Nika. Can I follow uh, that yes, up? Yes, Jeffrey. Um, oh. And this will be the last comment that we make about the residency, because we have to get to some other slides as well today. And I think that we really need to hold off on that. But Jeffrey, yes? Yeah, just to go along with what Danica said, that uh, you know, the, with, if the eviction moratorium fails, there's going to be a lot of people that would probably be targeted for social equity benefits that would end up having to move anyway yeah. to get a, after this last year we've had. So just that's another thought that I just and thought right. It is, and it's just not uncommon to move, especially if rents go up or you know life changes, and there is a flexibility and mobility to not owning as well. Thank you both. So um, we're not voting on this. We're going to come back to this residency requirement um, on our next call. I, I'm going to go to um, supporting documents that we wanted for a social equity candidate, um, just a proof of conviction and court documents, um, and then proof of residency. You know, we had a number of driver's license, the voter registration card, the signed lease agreement. But I'm going to come back to this when we figure out if there's going to be residency or not requirement, because then we may not need any of this except for that first requirement. Uh, fees, glorious fees. What do we want? How can we reduce or eliminate licensing fees um, and also application fees? So we give you on um, sort of the city of Denver for Colorado um, and what they're doing there. Um, they have a city fee for delivery programs at 2000, but that's only open to social equity um, candidates. Um, their application fee is waived for all of social equity candidates and all of retail and medicinal licenses are 50% off for social equity. In Illinois, social equity applicants get a 50% discount. Um, Non-social equity applicants, um, so it's just 50% across the board. Um, in Massachusetts, um, they have a waive application fee, but do charge if they're um, for the cost of the background check, and they also get 50% reduction in annual licensing fee, regardless of the licensing type. In Michigan, um, they have it a little bit of difference. Um, they have three criteria um, that you can fall under. So if you are from a disproportionately impacted community and resided there in the last five or 10 years, um, you get a 25% fee reduction. If you are a primary caregiver between 2008 and 2017 for at least two years, you get a 10% reduction um, and if there was you had a conviction uh, for a misdemeanor it's 25 percent reduction and for felony convictions it's a 40 percent fee reduction for a max that you can receive is 75 percent um, of their application and annual fee so what um, we kind of have what should it look like for Vermont um, one of the recommendations is that obviously for a social equity applicant, that first year um, would be the most expensive. Um, and that's one of the things that I really want us to consider when we're reviewing this right now. Um, a lot of states do that the application fees are waived, um, which can be a very good recommendation for the state of Vermont. Um, I've put a couple of recommendations out here where if a first year is waived, 
the second year would be 25% of the fee, the third year being 50%, fourth year being 75% of the fee. And that fifth year, which we're hoping to um, make sure that these people are able to subsist, stay on their own would be full price. Another recommendation is doing the first year at 50% of the fee and then increasing it um, 10%, so 60% in the second year, 70% in the third year, 80% in the fourth year, and once again saying that this year should be full price. That we're hoping to establish that we are with reports and making sure that social equity licensee holders by that fifth year they should be able to be um, stable and be able to pay a uh, full price. With that in mind, we have any other recommendations? You know, do you want that first year waive, that second year 50% off? Do you only want it for two years? Um, every everyone starts. I will start um, with Ashley. How do you feel about the discount? And I'm really glad that we are bringing this up because, you know, again, like when we're talking about these applicants, we're talking about these applicants for every step of the supply chain or just for retail sales? This is for every aspect. Yeah. We can right. break it down if you would right. like. I thought the easiest to do is just have something standardized across the board. Right. So, um, I just wanted to clar clarify that a little bit because sometimes I, I forget myself like that A, this industry is going to go on for years and years and years and years and years and two, that um, they will, you know, whoever adjusts dif these different sections of the supply chain are at some point or another going to be making money and having a thriving business wherever they decide to enter into the industry. So just want to make sure that that's clear. Um, I agree with you, the first year is the most expensive um, and I think would be the most advantageous for getting people that advantage um, that will be needed in this competitive market. Um, I think perhaps even the second year, we can increase those um, to 50% waiving of the fees, then um, third year, or we could do, you know, second year, 75%, third year, 50%, fourth year, 25%, and then um, that fifth year, they're playing full price for their licenses. Also, keeping in mind, too, um, I haven't done the research, but maybe um, maybe you guys would know, um, do licensing fees change at, like with inflation? Like, the way that licenses have been set as is for the existing industry, let's say, like in California, have those fees stayed the same? Have there been general increments of increase in fees? As, uh, as yourself? I don't know the answer to that. I can't answer that solid right now either. Sorry. I'm not sure. Okay. I, I mean, e either way, I'll, if, I, I, I think, think it would be on a state by state basis. Yeah. Yeah. It is okay. very, very expensive. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I think I think I like these. I like the idea of these percentages. Um, and I do agree that that first year should be waived. The fee should be waived. And are you okay with waiving the application fee or should there be some charge for that? The application fee is for get, um, your initial licensing fee, applying to get a license. Right, no, I understand that. I mean, how, like like we've talked about, and Susanna has talked about how can we do the most good, you know, um, and create the, the most competitive applicant of this group of people. I, I you know, I think I think it should all be waived that first year, um, if we can, if we can get you know committee support on that one. Great, thank you. And it seems like you are on the recommendation one. Um, I see Danica, your hand raised. Yes, the only um, thing I'd like to add to that is if we have an idea of the hard cost to the CCB or to the state of Vermont for processing an application or at least an estimation may also help us in some of this area as we continue these discussions. Some things are going to have a physical hard cost and then some are, well, everything is a hard cost when it comes to labor. But at the same time, it's, it's um, what does that application 
processing even look like? Uh, yes, Danica, thank you so much for that comment. Unfortunately, we're doing this along with the uh, marketing fees and, and structures at the same time. Um, so um, they haven't made a determination, um, but they would like to know um, how we feel about social equity so that they can make appropriate fees across the board. Um, Nader, how do you feel about um, application and licensing fees? So uh, similar to what Ashley said, you know, I, I think it should be waived. Um, I think, and so I, I'm primarily looking at recommendation one, where the first year is waived. Uh, my only concern is, you know, it takes a while to start turning a profit in any business. And so my only concern is, you know, after that first year, if that business is struggling more so than usual, that 25% might be a big jump, which is why that lower 10% um, increment, the lower 10% increment of recommendation two, that, that's appealing, but I also wanna see at least the first year wave. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't know how significant that difference between 25% versus, um, or rather, I don't know how significant the difference is between the 15 year, sorry, 15% jump versus the 10% jump. Um, but th that's somebody, uh, if somebody has more business sense than I do, that that might be useful uh, for them to chime in. Uh, so with your, are you saying for that second year, you want them to pay only 10% of the application fee instead of 25% or 15% versus 25%. Right, sorry, I, I know I, I wasn't very articulate. Um, you know, I'm, I'm leaning generally more towards recommendation one, um, but if we're, as it's presented, but if anybody has any thoughts on whether or not the 25% is a is, might be too big of a jump for a business that's struggling after their first year. Um, I'd, I'd like to know, but generally I lean towards recommendation one. Okay. As it's written. Um, and we can we can get you that information. And Julio, um, just if I can get your thoughts, and Danica, I'm just going to put you on hold for one minute um, and to speak after public comments, if that's okay with you. Yes, that's actually I was making sure we knew time was here. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Julio? Um, so I thought that Nader made really good points here. I, I would say that, like, I'm not sure, like, he's not sure that um, startups, particularly ones that, that may have had a, a history of disadvantage, would be able to turn the corner by the second year. I think that, and, and who knows what the trajectory would be for the third year I, i'm sort of flying at this a little blind because i don't have a sense of what how much the fees are um but i, I think that it would be I, I, i'm okay with recommendation one provided that it also includes a process for someone to seek a waiver of the fee they can demonstrate you know an appropriate level of financial hardship and so that it can be subject to evaluation because someone might come in and have terrific success in the first year, 25% wouldn't be much of a burden, or, or it could be the third or fourth year. But um, I think that the number of uh, licensed persons or, or their businesses is, is likely not to be large and so large that that can't be something that can be evaluated by the board on an ongoing basis. I think it should be a little, there should be some kind of safety valve there. So if someone is um, really struggling, then, you know, it isn't really in the interest to have a licensed, you know, entity fail or have fees be a big part of, you know, the, the failure or any kind of shortage. And so that's where I am on that. I think that's a great inclusion into this. And Nader, I just want to let you know that a lot of states does 50% after uh, for that second year. So just based on sort of the business aspect 
uh, for social equity, I think us going at 25% is taking into consideration and, and, and being very con conservative with that price if that helps you, Nader, um, with your decision. Um, I think um, I would like to have a vote now for recommendation one with putting in a stipulation that someone can apply for our financial hardship waiver if one needed to do so. Um, um, how do you feel about that, Ashley? Gina, can I interrupt you for a minute? We've got some people here who'd like to participate in the conversation, and I would like to save, make sure we save time for that. So it, we may need to push off a vote until next week or next meeting. Okay. So um, let's go to public comment. We have a public comment? Yeah, come on up. Right. And Nellie, if you can put the person's name in the chat box to come um, to speak, please. Uh, so this is Ronald Williams. Um, so I'll just start here. I prepared a, a little bit of a statement. Um, so yeah, my name is Ron Williams, and along with my partner here, Max Eingorn, and our third co-founder, Zach Tyson, make up Mr. Z Craft Cannabis, uh, and is a majority black-owned cultivator based in Middlebury, Vermont, where we currently live full-time. We practice sustainable, organic growing techniques, and we've come today to ask the committee not to include the requirement of one-year residency prior to licensure for social equity applicants and to modify it simply to require state residency, period. Yeah. We believe that the committee should ensure that not only is Vermont, the Vermont cannabis market equitable, but that it remains attractive for young, diverse communities that are currently underrepresented in the state. It is no secret that Vermont is not only faced with the dearth of people of color, but also of young working people. Uh, a one-year residency requirement for social equity applicants could prevent us and other young people of color from moving to the state and establishing long, fulfilling lives as Vermont cannabis entrepreneurs. As an example, my partners and I are childhood friends from New York City, notably at the height of stop and frisk, which is a policy that, by the way, has personally affected me. Um, we attended colleges bordering and uh, in Vermont, where we fell in love with the state. Um, you know why we moved here. Uh, faced with massive student loans and one of the worst job markets in American history, we did what we were supposed to do and pursued relatively well-paying careers in tech, finance, and law. We are entirely self-funded and, you know, using the help of friends and family as well, we do not accept any venture capital, uh, <laughs> period. This means we had an extremely difficult time finding a location without the use of a mortgage, notably, because that's illegal. Um, you know, paying for construction are the crucial steps in the process of establishing a business. On top of that, this state is currently experiencing a housing crisis, which uh, you know, Nader noted as well. Uh, to deal with a one-year residency requirement would be a serious barrier to entry at this point in any young company, any young person's journey. Uh, you know, the, the, the three of us moved here to pursue our passions and, and to become active participants within the Vermont cannabis community and our local communities and to immerse ourselves, you know, in the beauty of the state. Uh, you know, and it would be a shame to see us and other young people that look like us prevented from participating, you know, because of a one-year requ uh, residency requirement. Uh, in fact, we have friends who would actively come up here to help participate and uh, they need assurance that they will have a place for them, you know, and, uh, you know, we hope the committee does the right thing here and then makes us a truly inclusive, you know, market for all. Um, and that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any, is there any other public comment? Do you know those tables were made by slave labor? From our corrections well, industry. Dave knows. You know about BCI, don't you? About PSC? Are you trying to make No. The, um, for, my, for my corrections industries, oh, yeah. the, the ones that are making all of this nice furniture for us. <clears throat> hey, it's uh, Mark Hughes again. I'm uh, with the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance, and we are one of the members of the Vermont uh, Cannabis Equity Coalition. And um, so, yeah, we're, I'm almost finished with uh, our full comments on the breadth of the discussion with, um, with uh, equity. Um, there are, um, 
Hey, can you hand me that computer, please? I, I think I got some notes in there. There's a couple, couple things I, I just wanted to go back to, and then there's um, a couple things I wanted to address. Again, we're running up against a time crunch because none of the stuff that we're doing here is re reasonably ex uh, can we reasonably expect to accomplish. Um, but I would like to take a couple of minutes. In H414 that we uh, left on the wall in government operations uh, this year. Um, there were three components of H414, and we talked a little bit about it last time I was here. One was the Cannabis um, Business Development Fund itself. And there doesn't seem to be any conversation about the Cannabis Business Development Fund. And before I go into anything, um, Gina, is there any um, something on the agenda in the future to have that conversation? Because I can just um, move on if there is. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes, yeah, we we just haven't got we haven't gotten to it. Okay. We're just trying to get the the, the foundation right now. Okay. Well, the the reason why I brought it up is is that's pretty foundational because that's where all the money is. Um. So um. So yeah, we can come back to that. Um. Then, um. And talk about its sustainability. The other thing is is the uh, community social equity program itself. The community social equity program which is, seems to be right now um, being fused uh, together with this social equity applicant process. Again, Gina, not to put you on the spot, it's good to see you again. Uh, is there a conversation that we will be having about the community social equity program yes. as, as it pertains to H414? Yes, we will. Okay. Thank you so much for that. That would be great. Those comments would be appropriate then. And then as far as um, funding the social equity program, um, the, uh, the last part of S, uh, H414 spoke to, um, specifically it spoke to the, the whole idea of um, integrated license holders um, and through the integrated licensing process that in addition to the fees required uh, for contribution to the Cannabis Development Fund, uh, that it was also provisions that would provide an option for integrated license holders to choose from additional contribution options, uh, including the Vermont Community College Cannabis Industry Training Fund, the jobs training program, and also the reentry, uh, or, and, and I think the other one was host cannabis business establishment incubator. So are we, is there any conversation that we're having on H414 or any other programs like these that would be applicable um, or are we are those like later or or no we will be discussing integrated licenses which you um know are not a guarantee of funding and we will be talking about um ways on how we can spend that cannabis development fund and in integrated ways sort of like uh, incubator program um but we first needed to establish what the candidate was and what benefits um, that they will be getting. Okay. And so next week we're hoping to get up to the benefits, which will then start discussing licenses and then we will then proceed hopefully the following week on when, um, how to, what to do with those ones. All right, I appreciate that. So when it, so obviously today's discussion, there is a huge intersection on market structure, licensing, taxes, and fees, that particular group. So um, what we're, what I'm trying to get after is, is I'm just trying to better understand this whole, um, um, there's, there's, there's recommendations for, um, some kind of approach to addressing discounted fees here, but there hasn't really been a market structure established in terms of licensing. I guess all of this stuff has to just play itself out parallel. In order to meet our deadlines. I right, think. in order to meet our deadlines because we're in a hurry. Well. Okay, um, and um, regarding Lowe versus the city of Detroit, um, if I think, um, Julio is still on. Um, it looks like a local control license um, case, actually, uh, not a statewide social equity case. So there would be a criteria established for licensing, carte blanche, and then there would seem to be a separate criteria required for social equity applicants. So 
I think there's a um, there's some confusion because in the, the city of Loweth, Loweth, Detroit, that it, it was a local control on the license, not a social equity applicant. So technically, the social equity applicant who was denied in Detroit could apply for a license uh, with uh, no equity qualifier. So I don't think that that particular case is apples with these apples. Um, I think it's more like oranges. Um, and I think that um, it's perfectly fine to establish a different criteria for a social equity applicant as opposed to an, a criteria for just a, a regular license applicant. And I think really what it bumps up against uh, is, is what my esteemed colleague was just saying earlier is, is that I think, if I'm not mistaken, they're looking for a social equity applicant yeah. application. Um, there would be nothing to preclude them from doing business in this state without such, um, because they would just have to qualify under the regular application process. And I think that the criteria that, was that we are seeking to establish for so social equity applicants um, is, I think it is being um, created to be more stringent so as to avoid situations where folks who come from out of the state um, may be taking advantage of a program and denying folks who are in the state access to that same program. So I think that's the delineation. As far as folks being impacted, it is my personal opinion that it doesn't make any difference in what 50 state a, a person is impacted. It seems as though they ought to be able to realize the same benefits here in the state of Vermont because we are a part of the United States. So um, that's all I'll say for now. Um, I'm glad that we're going to get to these other parts about, uh, uh, well, actually, since we're here, no, I won't do that to you. That's all I'm going to say now. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Have a great afternoon. <laughs> Is there any other public comment? <clears throat> There's no one behind me. I think that's it for public comment today. Okay, excellent. Gina, is there anything else as we're five after the hour, or um, would we like to follow up in email correspondence? Yeah, we're follow up via email. Okay, excellent. Uh, so Indeed. Motion to adjourn. Not or ask. Nobody wants to leave. <laughs> they, want, they want the rest of your presentation. <laughs> Everybody loves social equity. That's why. Um, yeah. Can we? Can uh, Ashley? Can that be the um? That first. First, yeah. Okay, we'll try this one more time. Can we have a motion to adjourn? Can I talk to you? Always. And I think we lost Ashley. Uh, Nader or Julio? <laughs> I'll make that motion. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Nice Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. No, everybody yeah. loves social yeah. equity. Yeah. 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 Have a great day. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.